Well, hello there, and welcome to a film a day with me, Jordan Woodley. And yes, we have the Marvel t-shirt, but not in the way that you might expect, because um, breaking away from the um, retrospective series of uh, going through all of the Marvel films, I knew this was coming, and unfortunately by the time I'd started that series, there was no way for me to be able to um, circumvent it without having to watch two Marvel films a week, which... I also thought was a bad idea for the sort of flow of the series. But yes, uh, as, a, as a disruption to normal scheduling, I have decided to watch the newly released um, cinema viewing of Black Widow. Now, of course, um, this is another case where, yes, it's on the TV here behind me. However, I did watch it in the theatre. And I am starting to see a pattern now where the problem lies, really, which is when it comes to sort of the um, the dual release uh, nature of a lot of um, blockbuster films, we are seeing a not noticeable um, disparance between those who are seeing it for the first time in the theatre and those who are seeing it for the first time um, in the, in their own home uh, theatre, you know, and and it's not that people who see a big blockbuster for the first time at home significantly like it less than those who see it in the cinema, but um, or vice versa, where people who see it in the cinema just to be just because they're so pleased to be in the cinema, um, they're over praising films that aren't as good as um, they they are being reviewed. It's more a sort of a noticeable, um, like I say, a noticeable pattern, really, that there is a certain... The things that are... The things that make the cinematic experience great are, of course, enhanced through, um, you know, widescreen, Dolby Atmos audio. You know, you get that sense of... The theatrical experience and no matter how good the home uh, movie experience is it 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 cannot be as good as the theatrical and there is a sense of communal um uh, enjoyment in films that people like um and so there are films that even through this series i've watched and have thought how much i would have liked to see them in the theater to get the full experience and as I say, all it is, is an enhancement of feelings people will already have had. The negatives are enhanced, the positives are enhanced. The experience is just more, the spectrum of feeling is just a bit wider. Because with Black Widow, there is definitely a sense of uh, lukewarm um, attitudes towards it. Of the reviews that I've seen, no one has outright said it's terrible, but everyone's attitude, or in the same way, I don't think I've seen anyone who's loved it, but everyone's attitude has been either, it, yeah, it's fine, it, it, it is a movie, it's nice to see, or mm, it's okay, um, particularly for a Marvel film, it's sort of lower tier. And I am, a, I have to say, going into this, I was a bit um, perturbed, because... You know, it is to have gone so long without a Marvel film in the theatre, and that's only been implicated by um, the several TV series that have been released on Disney Plus. Um, the idea that the first one out the gate, everyone's reaction is, like I say, lukewarm, a little bit like, well, yeah, this this will do, especially as we have waited for a Black Widow film all the way back from the first Avengers, so we're talking like nine years at this point. It's a shame. And I and the criticisms that I heard, although I was trying to keep myself spoiler free for the most part, so it was more in general terms were issues of certain performances and certain um, set pieces and obviously how it fitted into the grander MCU. And so going in, I, I, I was, like I say, perturbed by... The, the the rumblings I'd heard, which is why I was shocked when I first started watching it, and I genuinely loved 
the f- opening scene of this film. Um, so just to kind of say from the off, this is going to be a spoiler-free uh, discussion, so I'm not going to go into a great deal of plot points or character arcs and, and obviously uh, spoilers for this. I will, however, spoil things related to the grander MCU all the way up to Endgame or, or Far From Home, which was the last one. So, uh, d- you know, that that's... Um, you know, it's only things within the Black Widow film that I will try to avoid spoiling, or at least the the important things. But yeah, the opening scene with the family was such a good opening scene. It was so quiet and relaxed, and you kind of knew where it was going, but the way that it plays out, the way that you see this uh, sleeper agent family being um, activated... Um, or, or no, I suppose the other way around, they're being decommissioned. And you see these two children, just their worlds implode in the way that it, that it does. It's not something I expected from an MCU film, it's something I expected from a more traditionalist spy film. And then to have the opening um, scene, uh, the, the montage, the title scene, with um, a much more dour version of Smells Like Teen Spirit as we see Natasha and Yolanda in the Red Room and you see how they, are f- how they were formed and shaped and sent out to become these um, assassins and, and, and uh, um, ruthless agents. The way we see that Red Room sequence and, and the parallels between uh, Florence Pugh's Yolanda and... Um, Elena, sorry, um, and uh, Natasha. It is uh, it, you really see how they're sort of setting up that sense of rivalry, tension, but also familiarity between them. Um, as this goes, of course, this fits just after Civil War in terms of the grander MCU timeline, and I have to say, it does very nicely slip right back into that period within the the, 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 the grand um, Marvel story. Um, I mean, Scarlett Johansson just seamlessly uh, picks up from that plot point, and you don't feel like the years that have um, surpassed it and the, the way that character, the direction she's gone, have burdened uh, Scarlett Johansson's performance. I honestly think that she does give this really great quiet performance to her i know in dealing with sort of the collapse of one family as she goes to reacquaint herself with another and the way that it brings together um rachel wise david harbour Florence Pugh, and um and scarlett johansson is is you know it, it they have a really good dynamic a really good sense of chemistry together and what I like is the fact that it doesn't throw them together. It actually takes its time. Um, and then, of course, you've got Florence Pugh, David Harbour, who are just fantastic additions. Uh, Florence Pugh, as it's very obvious that, you know, and the conversation has been had, even from the point in which they announce, um, announced her sort of joining the MCU, whether she would take up the mantle. And regardless of what their plan is for her in the future, you can see how well she fits in. You can see, I mean, even like I say, with her chemistry with uh, ScarJo, you know, you can see how how easily she could um, take up the mantle of the Black Widow after um, the uh, you know after the events of Endgame and and the and the death of Natasha Romanoff. And David Harbour is such a great addition. I don't anticipate that his character will become sort of a major part of the MCU, but those three specifically have a really great rapport. This is something funny, but also dark and twisted. It, it really walks a nice line between this fake family and the bond that they have. And the, the the darker undertones of espionage and, and, and you know the loss of childhood and sort of the, the the fictional nature of their relationship. Rachel Wise is excellent, but of the four, she is the one who probably gets the least play of all the characters. Um and 
like I say, I'd, I'd say it's really on the shoulders of Florence Pugh and David Harbour. So um, I, I definitely think that they... I don't know, they make something of this that's that's just enhances it and made it, for me, a, a very enjoyable experience because it's, it's, it is this spy thriller, but it's much more a family drama and much more a character piece and much more an exploration of trauma and um, the relationships between people who, who have sort of been programmed into their lives together rather than uh, chosen or, or been born into it. Um, and yeah, and then really at the heart of it, that's that's where it is at its strongest. The spy stuff is also interesting, and the idea of clearing up, um, you know, the mistake, you know, the actions of the past and the trauma, like like I said, the trauma that exists within someone and the ways that it's addressed. It makes a it, an interesting spy thriller. It's not the most. I don't think it's quite on the level of the Winter Soldier style of spy thriller, but. It, it it's a good enough character piece that the sort of you know it has that sort of echoes of Red Sparrow or um uh oh Platinum Blonde is it um oh the Charlie's Throne one if the name's gone out of my head um Atomic Blonde. Atomic Blonde that's right um you know you get the the the, the echoes of that and yeah I do think. You know, if there's anything that doesn't work, it's it, it when it has to later on go back into being the MCU film and obviously having the big action set pieces, that's probably where it's at its weakest. Um, it just isn't, you know, when you have such good character drama and such interesting um, espionage thriller aspects, the, the, fam the, the MCU big set pieces just aren't that interesting especially knowing where Natasha's story ends it kind of makes it uninteresting to see these um death death defying um stunts because we know that for her there's no stake in it you know th there isn't a risk of her life in any meaningful way because we know the end of her story and I suppose that really sort of sort of leaning into the criticisms that I have of it, it is the fact that this really feels like a film out of place. Now, of course, it was the release was already delayed by a year because of uh, COVID. Um, and 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 so there is beyond that, there is something about it that feels like it's much later. It's a much later release than it should be. This feels like a film that should have been released probably at the time in which it's set, just after Civil War, around that period. Because it, it doesn't feel like it's subverting our expectations in terms of, oh, we know that Natasha is dead by the end of Endgame, so instead of creating that sense of threat to life, why don't we explore a different side, a di create a different sense of threat and scale. And that's the direction I thought they were going to go, but particularly as we get into the third act, it is more traditional um, action, and unfortunately that, that's reliant on the idea that our character is in peril. Which they just aren't. They just There isn't for her. There are, of course, for her supporting characters, but when your lead is sort of in this safe place. It's it's hard to like, you know, to be emotionally engaged in the way that that we'd want to be. And of course, this isn't you know a comic book MCU film. It's not. It's unlikely that the lead of your film is going to die by the end. Possible, but it's un. It's significantly unlikely. Um. And there are certain plot beats and elements that really don't work. I think the villain stuff primarily is the issue with it. So you have Ray Winston um, as a villain called, oh, was it Drakonov? Something, you know. And he's fine, but he's sort of this generic villain type who doesn't, you know, he has a relationship with Natasha in, in terms of her backstory, but it's not the most compelling. And it doesn't, it only fleshes out so much. 
and, and you can tell Ray Winston is trying to give it that sinister edge. And of course, he's very good at, you know, being that sort of um, threatening, sort of almost charming, and yet at the same time equally as sinister. But here it just doesn't work. Um, the, the one thing that really bothered me is the accent really didn't work for him. Like, you know, we, he has to, he, he's supposedly Russian and is supposed to have this Russian accent and it doesn't work at all. It just doesn't, he, it feels like he's fighting against that and that's unfortunately very distracting. But beyond that, the character as a whole is just a little uninteresting. He's very one note. His motivations are very uncomplicated. And then you have Taskmaster. And Taskmaster, unfortunately, is a very similarly one note villain. You know, their function is to, it is almost drone like. They're there to, um, you know, as a physical threat. There is an almost like Terminator aspect to them where they, you know, they're chasing down um, our leads um, and they are this sort of unstoppable force. But again, if you put it alongside Winter Soldier, it, you know, the Winter Soldier felt much more threatening than Taskmaster. And additionally, and again, I'm not wanting to go into spoilers, but of course the big sort of question is, oh, who is Taskmaster? What's their, you know, investment within this story? And the revelation is, it's fine. It's a little underwhelming. It's, it's, um, obviously there is that whole culture of fan speculation and people wanting it to be something and being disappointed when it's not what they want. And that is a flawed way of thinking. But unfortunately they, they did in the, within the narrative of the film, hype up this character who, yeah, it's mildly interesting who they are, but it's not groundbreaking and I understand that Taskmaster is a major Marvel character not for me I've never really had a lot of Taskmaster um, engagement but it is the kind of character who you think oh they deserved a bit more scale and importance than what they had there is this other aspect to Taskmaster which is of course the whole thing about them having the ability to mimic and replicate any um, moves that they see, and that's not just in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but things like, you know, um, if they saw Hawkeye shooting a bow and arrow, they'd be able to perfectly replicate it. And that's such an interesting character um, sort of detail for a villain, and could have been quite interesting. And in the comics, I'm sure it is hugely interesting when they appear. However, the problem, where, where the problem lies is the fact that the MCU, unfortunately, only go so far in making the choreography of their combat particularly distinct and in this case the, the problem is is that you the, the demonstration of Taskmaster's abilities are not that interesting it is just someone else who can fight in a very similar style to all the other MCU characters their powers don't feel that exciting or, or, or you know there's no sense of grand choreography to them or, or demonstration of choreography and it's it's unfortunate because it just just it makes them a bigger sub boss than the drones that that our characters have to fight i mean i'm making it sound like all of the sort of marvel um tent poles are the weakest parts and yes there is a certain aspect to that but you know there is this really cool prison sequence um, with David Harbour's Red Guardian and, and, and I do think that was quite cool and everyone has some pretty good lines in it it establishes Red Guardian as this almost Captain America like figure and also the fact that he believes himself to have this grand relationship to Captain America that's a little bit interesting and, and you think oh it would have been cool, to, you know, it would be cool to see that sort of some version of that but you know, as a character detail, it's really nice. And again, that whole set piece is probably the best of the film. Um, so yeah, the, my feeling about this, it's unfortunately, I understand people's attitudes, this sort of lukewarm, it's fine, it is a Marvel film. I liked it a lot. I really liked it. Maybe it's because I'm in the theatre for the third, fourth time, and I'm still getting the high of just being back in the cinema and also watching an MCU film. 
Um, maybe it's because of my investment within the sort of the big grand story as a whole, and it's great just to see um, Scarlett Johansson as Natasha. I don't know, but I did like this. You know, I really did like this. I don't think it's the greatest, but I don't think it's anywhere near the worst of the MCU films. I, I do think this is a perfectly... Uh, see, I want to say functional, but that's, that's a little backhanded. It's more than that. It's, it's a, it is a good Marvel story. I appreciate that, yes, if this is the big send-off of Natasha Romanoff, it is possibly a bit weak. It's possibly a bit lacking in, in a big send-off for the character but and, and I do still think it should have it should have been released made and released at the time in which it's set during that sort of civil war period and that would have I think it would have had a significant greater effect but you can't really rewrite history and I do think for where it is I thought this was was good it was fun and again, it's, it's, you know, if this is the last time we get Black Widow, this was a, a good way to sort of see her off. Um, anyway, thank you for joining me. If you like this video, hit the like button, uh, comment below and share the video because it's all helping the algorithm. Uh, subscribe to the channel and hit that little bell to get notifications of when new videos are uploaded and check out my back catalogue of almost 200 videos. We're getting closer and closer. Uh, Follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore Woodley where I'm always tweeting about TV shows and films and I share these videos once they're uploaded to YouTube either the day of or the day after. Thank you for joining me. Take care.